Wild Africa, the way it can be seen in books, scenes from distant times. But, as is so often the case, initial appearances can be deceptive. Human hands were involved here. Elephants and African buffaloes compete for water now, but for a long time there were only cattle herds here. That led to complete overgrazing and to a desire for a better future. The Madikwe Game Reserve is an African story of the phoenix from the ashes type. It's about a return to the wild. When economists dream, even elephants and lions can get wings. The idea of a game reserve was born as a utopia, to create development and jobs in one of the weakest economic regions in the northern part of South Africa. The plan was a success. The longing for wilderness attracts affluent tourists from all around the world. They don't realize that 20 years ago there was barely a tuft of grass left here. Medikwe was farming land that was given to white farmers. But if you look at the history of the Medikwe area, if you read your hunting books from Salu, Livingston, all these white frontier guys, they all came through Medikwe. And we know that um, Livingston used to actually camp in Medikwe before he used to actually go down into Botswana. And that was because what they used to do is they used to shoot game, dry the meat, and thus get enough resupply to carry on for another 10 days. So that tells you that Medikwe was always a game rich area. So to me, Medikwe is the best kept secret in Southern Africa. I think it's just one of those wonderful places where if you really want to experience something different, uh, something unique, something wild, you've got to come to Medikwe. You can't say you've been to the bush if you haven't been to Medikwe. That may be marketing interests of the lodge owner talking, but it's certain that Madikwe is a proper wilderness again. How are we With the creation of uh, Madikwe Game Reserve and the relocation and the re-importation of certain species of game, uh, on the back of that this is what we called Operation Phoenix. And I think till today it's still the largest relocation of wild animals in the, in the world at the moment. Uh, I think 10,000 head of game were moved and hence the game reserve Medikwe, that's how we started. We started with elephant and from there um, we started with lions and we brought in hyena, um, leopard we've never had to touch because there's always been a, a very healthy uh, population of resident leopard um, and of course a couple of cheetah. Wild dog was our biggest uh, trump card. It was our, you know, it was what made Medikwe. It was the the trump card of every game reserve has got its strengths and weaknesses and of course Medikwe's strength is the wild dog. The wild dog is what really made the difference. It wasn't as easy as it sounds. False ambition can dog you for a long time.
It takes a huge amount of work and a lot of ecological know-how to create a functioning ecosystem out of nothing. Choosing wild dogs as a logo is easy. Keeping them going in the wild is very difficult. They need enough prey, for one thing. Wild dogs are very special. If you look at the number of them in South Africa, it has decreased quite a lot. Where we call them the second endangered carnivores. But as far as uh, the world is concerned, Madikwe is about wild dogs. The wild dog population seems secure for now. But not all species did quite so well. The ambitious Operation Phoenix had to cope with the odd setback too. The import of 10,000 wild animals to an area of 750 square kilometers hasn't been a complete success story. Some of the species that are rare in the wild came from breeding farms, and they don't keep any predators. Looking at the sable antelope, which was one of the antelope that was introduced, when they see uh, lions, they approach them because they saw the, they see lions for the first time. And I think this is how they got eaten because they did not know what the lion looked like. And then obviously they were not learning. They didn't have that knowledge of should we run or should we go and find out? They did not realize that lions were major enemies for them. But otherwise the majority of game doing really well. The stated desire was to bring back all of the wild species that once lived here. Quite a lot of ecologists thought this experiment was crazy. But some were inspired by the biblical scale of the thing, the idea of reconstructing a natural Noah's Ark. The biggest problem is creating a natural balance based on a human master plan. Our buffaloes actually they came from Czech Republic, from breeding centers, uh, due to the diseases uh, that uh, were found within the buffaloes in Africa. So we had to take them somewhere far away so that they don't get the diseases. And uh, having expensive buffaloes like that in Madigwe, we had to get lions that don't have the skills of hunting buffaloes. So we went to Etosha, that's where we got uh, our lions from, uh, so that they don't kill the buffaloes. It gave our buffaloes enough chance to increase their number. But nowadays, every now and then, you find uh, lions sitting on a buffalo kid. Lions and buffaloes tend to avoid each other in Madikwe. The Itosha lions are still suspicious of the big animals. Cheetahs, on the other hand, were old acquaintances, and now they compete for food. When we come to cheetahs, there was two coalitions of males that were introduced in the beginning and about several females, which they were breeding. And then since that time up to last year, we did not have this cheetah sighting like what we used to because lions were killing them. And then last year, there was a four brothers that were brought in the park and they were released by December last year and then they now searching looking for the area for them to settle in other words they're still also looking for females which we still have to see how they're doing with the lions before we can let them breed people as matchmakers for cheetahs that may be disillusioning for some nature lovers, especially since most wildlife documentaries suggest there's a wilderness independent of human beings.
uh, with the sniffing dogs, uh, which they will always be out there looking, uh, following the animals to see whether the poaching will be still continue going on. But we have lost over 25 runners in two years. For a long time, the local population around the national parks was considered the greatest danger to the abundance of wild animals. Protecting them was synonymous with keeping neighboring communities from using any of the resources. But that was often counterproductive and pushed them into poaching. If you look at Madikwe Game Reserve, it's very lucky where it's situated now because it is surrounded by the community. So there's a lot of security out there. Community is talking about the villages where we come from. They are very close by. And then we know that, you know, this is something that we're going to live out from for a very long time. Even our children and their children, they're going to have to come and work or live into this reserve. So we are acting as a security as well to make sure that, you know, all our animals or our wildlife is not getting destroyed. The game reserve is designed to serve primarily the advancement of the local population. Uh, I grew up here where you see the palm tree behind us and uh, the way we grew up because it was a, in a farming area we, it was mainly livestock as young boys I remember playing around here and uh, uh, we used to head cattle, we used to head goats in this area. Madikwe's history goes back all the way to the apartheid era. In those days, the area was part of Fufu Tatswana, one of several so-called homelands. The idea behind these pseudo-states was to facilitate the decreed development of racial segregation. Neither they nor their presidents were internationally recognized. Ex-President uh, Lucas Mangopi, he, he uh, received funding from uh, some countries in Scandinavia to help establish what is the best utilization of this land. And the conclusion out of that was to open it up for tourism instead of cattle, cattle farming or, or hunting. Uh, and the main uh, idea behind it was that uh, tourism as it is now would uh, create the most uh, job opportunities. And that's why Madikwe is quite unique in the sense that it was found on economic principles originally, not necessarily uh, conservation principles. But these two principles obviously is, is uh, what we have to make work in this, in this new model of conservation. In the new democratic South Africa, environmental protection is a top priority. It comes right after fighting poverty through economic development. Lions and elephants bring tourists into the country, and they create wealth. That's the simple success strategy. After the medical creation, most of the lodges were by independent uh, entrepreneurs, mostly very rich white people. Uh, then the government parks board, in, because it's the one who is controlling everything, realized that black people are left behind. Hence they come to the neighboring communities and give them an opportunity to develop a lodge of their own inside the game reserve. Nelson Mandela's government managed to build bridges over what seemed to be insurmountable chasms. Black and white, the moneyless population and rich investors. Even elephants and people were to come together. Takario is owned by the community. Most of our staff are from the community. 99.9%. Okay. And we support the community by the wood and some of the 
products from the community and support the school. All right, uh, tell me, which one is your favorite animals in the bush? Zebras. Zebras, yeah. Elephants. Elephants. And you? Elephant. Elephant. Why elephant? Because it's big animal. Because it's big animal. In the villages, um, there's also always uh, somebody in charge, which is the chief. And the involvement that I've seen with him is that um, he formed a link between the villagers and also the lodges, because um, you have to have a link between the two so that we can have a flow communication. The traditional cheese, or kagozi, want to make sure the village communities profit from the abundance of wildlife in their immediate surroundings. It's therefore an advantage to identify with a powerful animal. In our tradition, you are recognized. In that ceremony, you wear a leopard skin. It says, this color is a sign of interaction of peace. You are a peacemaker. Hence the leopard. The leopard is very, is very secretive. It doesn't, you can't see it mostly. You, you see it by chances. And that's, it's not a pro problematic animal as such. It only goes that mile when it is hungry. Other than that, no. It like peace, and it, that's how the causes are. The creation of a game reserve must have seemed more like a dangerous threat to the village community. If we consider the brouhaha a single bear can cause in Germany, we can maybe understand what the relocation of hundreds of elephants, lions and buffaloes will have meant here. The local population will have needed good incentives. Both Parksport as well as the investors, uh, when we meet through the management forum, the interest to a large extent is there to make this as a, a successful product. Because, and we often talk when we debate things as to what we should do and, and so on. It comes back to the original objective of Madikwe, which was there to create wealth for the communities around us. And there is, to, to a large extent, uh, engagement in that. Uh, whether it's sufficient, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I do think, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it helps us to make decisions in terms of what the broader outcome of Madikwe should be. And indeed, the communities have plenty of expectations. To make sure that they don't remain mere pious wishes, they need adequate ways in which they can participate in the decision-making processes. In my view, at least we could be communicating or holding meeting at least quarterly. At least quarterly. So that we become aware as to what is going on, they get our challenges if there are any, or our proposals if there are any. Then at the end of the day, we are all on par with relevant information. But as of now, I don't know, I don't recall as to when was I last in my government. I don't even recall. The modest wealth in the village is often based on a personal, entrepreneurial spirit. I think I've done my own marketing of making the laundry. And that's where I make my money. And I'm still making money. So I'm taking the laundry from the uh, reserve, taking the linen, to come to be washed here in my laundry and take it back again. And the second thing is uh, I'm delivering the food at uh, too many lodges and 
I'm taking also rubbish from Safari and Tree Lodge. The Madikwe management has learned from the mistakes of the past in other parts of Africa. Here, they want to make sure that wildlife and tourism don't flourish at the expense of the local population here. On the contrary. Employment was the main reason why Medikwi was created. Employment was its, its government's answer to its problem. And what they did is they created a game reserve which was based on exclusive lodges within this game reserve. And exclusive lodges are always beneficial to the populace because what you have is you've got an exclusive lodge that is really labor intensive. My both lodges have got uh, local managers um, because they've been with us for 10 years and it's because we train from within, um, our, our chefs. So there's always this ongoing training and that makes a big difference. So what you have is you have this upliftment from within and hence I think that's why lodges are fantastic little micro uh, places where this new South Africa of ours just really comes alive and inspires a lot of people. So the owners are happy to have people around Madikwe. The reason why is lodges and hotels and outside the cities is more different than in the bush. So people from the bush, they know what they do. People from the lodge, they, they buy some stuff and reuse them. So we do cook from the scratch. I can make food anywhere in the bush as long as I've got my matches, wood, and the work is how Madikwe it is. There's just one topic of conversation over poached eggs in orange peel and freshly toasted baguette. The safari experience with the big five. Lions, elephants, rhinos, buffaloes and leopards. Maybe also the identification of one or other of the animals they saw and its behavior. People come to see the big five and you know they tick off on their list oh okay we've seen the buffalo let's move on quickly and find the next one where I like to just sit very quietly and stop and stop all the noise in my head and just feel the animals to me that's the most important thing and a lot of people at home say oh you know you go on safari you like going on safari but for me the word safari is too small for such a big experience and it can be taken in the wrong way you know oh yes I go on safari and everything and for me it's more about a journey of the heart you know I really feel feel it in the heart it takes human meditators to get really close to the big five without being exposed to any danger They're called guides or rangers here. They are the key people of every safari. The ranger is absolutely crucial to the experience. 
because it's not just about the knowledge they have. You need to feel that they've got the passion as well because that's infectious. So if you've got like a great ranger who has fire in his belly for the wildlife and everything, then it just makes the experience even better. And a sense of humor is pretty good as well. There are not many women driving a 4x4. Patience Bogatsu is an exception. She works in an industry that's primarily seen as a dream job by young men. They long to be the new heroes of South Africa. But with the daily encounters with lions, it's not just about adrenaline rushes and testosterone surges. The first lion that I saw, I just fell in love with the bush from there and decided one day I will become a guide. The guides need a sixth sense on the safari excursions. They have to intuit where the most interesting sightings of the day will take place and they need to be able to explain the behaviors of all the animals. For example, the tender bonds between male lions. In the beginning, it was very tough because when I started, there weren't too many female guides and guiding is still a male-dominated industry. So several times they used to shout, shout at me on, on the way. Just like, patience, you're driving too slow. Can you please get out of the road? We want to pass then. But people get used to you doing it. And eventually, at some point, you have to stand up on your ground and say, hey, guys, I'm a guide as well, so they've got to respect you for who you are. Even though the ranger's basic salary isn't very much, together with the tourist's tip, it's enough to feed a family. The wild animals indirectly create social security by allowing people to buy livestock, which contributes to their livelihood. Previously, we would be relying on our elderly people's pension fund. So most of our mothers were unemployed or they would be working, someone will be working in a farm, some will be working in Johannesburg as domestic workers. So as youngsters then we would be staying home with our elderly parents. So I was raised by my grandmother while my mother was working in Johannesburg. So now life has changed because we get to work in the reserve. So instead of us living off our parents' pension fund, we can now work and look after our parents. Enough to eat, nice clothes, and a roof over your head. The prayers here don't ask for much. Prior to the development of Maliki Game Reserve, people of this community were having a tough time. There were no job opportunities, no food on the table. They had to travel to work in a far places in towns, Rastenburg, which is more than 100 kilometers away from here, and were forced to stay there because they cannot go travel every day. So there they have to pay rentals, buy food and so forth. So since the creation of Madikwe, a lot of young people fortunately managed to get employment around. Whatever little money they get from there, at least they are able to put food on the table. Even the church indirectly owes its new roof and the belfry to the wild animals. 
Only those who have a steady income can make generous donations. Once a week, they all meet. The laundry owner, lodge manager, the cooks and the receptionists. The initial skepticism has given way to broad approval for the game reserve. It was very good because we knew that it was going to create more jobs for, for people. You found like a per farm, it was only five families working within that farm. But uh, for now, it's over a thousand people employed, especially within the neighboring communities. Also people from far away, they get employed here. Excellent, and you? Hey, doctor, how you doing? Excellent, and you? Good. Anything interesting, that's fine. One of them is from Germany. She's worked her way up to be the senior ranger. She waxes lyrical about the community spirit between the safari guides. Good. Hi, everyone. The collaboration is great. All the guides help each other. We're connected to each other via radio. When one guide finds something, he shares it with everyone else. The guests who come to Madikwe benefit from the good teamwork between the lodges and guides. All the guides meet once a month to discuss how we can make sure that every guest can take home the best possible experience. The safari vehicles are multicultural meeting places. One of the guide's jobs is to act as a link, not just between humans and animals. The rangers also mediate between the cultures. The most important thing, apart from a love of nature, is to know people. Guides meet new people every two to three days. They've all got different expectations and interests. You've often got ten people in your vehicle who have completely different interests and backgrounds. They're from Africa or America or South America, and you have to accommodate them all. You have to succeed in getting them to feel that they've had a great experience, and that's not easy. It starts with the best seating position. Everyone wants the ultimate photo of the wildlife for the evening Facebook post. They all become propagators of a much longer success story. It was a very successful uh, uh, animal introduction up to so far because, you know, everything has been multiplying itself up to so far. So we've got the standard number that is required. Some of them they've increased, but, you know, we've got to monitor the, the animals in general. But Lines are there also to make sure that, you know, population is not getting out of hand. Lions don't reproduce quickly enough to curb the biggest animal population explosion. There are now more than 900 elephants in Madikwe. It's a number that's very close to the capacity limit, according to many. For some, it was a reason to celebrate when lions killed an elephant in Madikwe for the first time. Patience was once again the only ranger who, with her safari guests, attended the killing of the young male. All the others, including the film crew, were left with the battle for the carcass. It's confirmed once again that beginnings are tough, 
Maybe a new school of elephant hunting is just being created here. Elephants are success breeders and are now becoming more and more, which now if nothing is taken into consideration, the bush can become a desert and they will have no food, they will starve into death. So it's important to minimize or keep a certain amount of elephants to make sure that the, 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 the bush environment is safe and there will be always enough food for them to eat. There's disagreement among conservationists and ecologists about how best to tackle the problem. The method of the controlled shooting of entire herds, culling, has already been used in South Africa. This naturally goes against what most animal lovers want, as well as against the spirit of CITES. In Madriko, we don't allow hunting. It's all about conservation area, uh, controlling the population. If they get getting too many, we're using another system of capturing, selling off. It's very difficult to sell elephants. There are more than 200,000 elephants in neighboring Botswana, for example. The human population is 2 million. Madikwe's success could therefore become a problem one day. Who would have thought that a few cattle farms would become an animal paradise so quickly? If you look behind me, Right there, there is a wall standing, which is indicate the, the old farm houses, as well as the troughs for where they had to put some water for the cows to drink. I'm talking about 25 to 30 years ago, just before it becomes a game reserve. From the economists' point of view, the wild animals are mere value-adding factors. They believe they know how the land lies when it comes to conservation. That begs the question whether protecting species diversity is an irreplaceable good thing in itself, or whether it's only the material valuation that delivers the crucial impulse. For most people living in and off Madikwe, both arguments, the ecological and the economic, are of equal weight. The best way to utilize the land is to put a game on it. Because in comparison to where we sometimes drive, where the cattle used to really overgraze in the land, you can see the huge difference. And then they get to see that, you know, really farming was uh, really killing the land. And then up to so far, there's a huge difference at the moment if you look into the park. And it's only uh, a difference from uh, 20 years ago. Without investments from the private sector, we wouldn't have a watering hole or elephants here. All the great actors of the African wilderness would be without a job. Giraffes and baby lions as agents of development policy? This thought might be a sobering one, but just like big cinema, a well-stocked bush produces a special kind of emotional experience. I love every single second, um, even, if, even if we don't see anything for a very long time. I just, you know, feel the trees, the, the light, the, you know, the African light, basically, and um, the dust and the bush, and it just feels like home to me. Um, and so it's not just about the animals, it's about the whole 
sort of feeling that you're this small person on a very large planet. A planet with huge problems, we might add. The ruthless exploitation of natural resources is making the economic crises worse in many places. The relatively small Madikwe, on the other hand, has created a real win-win situation. In this sense, it's a big ray of hope in the face of a short-sighted profit mentality. Madikwe is the one model I think that most countries are taking very seriously from a point of view where you have a three-party um, agreement, it's between private enterprise, which are, I suppose, the developers, you have government, which is then um, Parks Board, and you have the local community, which are the communities on the peripheral of this game reserve. And with, the, with, with those three, you have a partnership from heaven. <laughs> A heavenly blessing or not, this game reserve proves that it can be progress to brave a step back into the wild.